Hi everyone, it's Miss Conley. I'm sorry I haven't been um, on reading more of Freedom Crossing. Um, decided to take a break for a little bit and um, read my books and go for walks because the weather is so beautiful out. So, um, so I am going to um, post um, the next two chapters and hopefully you'll follow along with me again. And then um, I'll get back on and do um, the other chapters tomorrow. Okay? All right. We'll see you soon. Okay, here we go with the next two chapters of Freedom Crossing. Bert is arrested. The bell sounded through the entire house. Martin covered his, covered his ears as if he couldn't endure the clamor. Bert said defiantly, we'll not go to the door. Motionless, the three sat in silence. On and on, the ringing continued until Laura thought the bell pull must break. Would their unwanted visitor never go away? Moving cautiously, Bert rolled back the carpet and motioned Martin into the hole in the floor. Laura found she was still clutching Uncle Tom's cabin. If the slave catchers saw it, they'd be even more sure that a runaway was hidden in the house. Hastily, she handed it to Martin before Bert slid the trap door into place. A shout came from the front steps. We know you're in there. Open the door. You'll have to let them in, Laura whispered to Bert. I'll count to ten, came from the deep, the deep voice from the porch. If you aren't here, we'll break in. <clears throat> Hurry, uh, urged Laura. Bert was tugging at the carpet. Wait till I get this straight. Laura jumped up and helped him, then recovered her sewing and sat tensely waiting. Bert left the room, but returned immediately, saying, I'll have to take the lamp so I can see who's there. All right, Laura dropped her sewing. I'm coming with you. They descended the stairs with Bert ahead carrying the lamp. With every step continuing on the porch came more clearly to their ears. Six, seven, we're coming, shouted Bert. Who's there? The counting stopped. Deputy Smith, came the answer. Open up, Bert. I have a warrant for your arrest. I haven't done anything wrong. You can explain that. You want your wanted quest for questioning. Laura heard another voice, one that was painfully familiar. Don't argue with him. Out of my way and I'll push in the door. The voice belonged to Walt. She might have known he'd be behind this. Bert unlocked the door and flung it open. What's the idea? He began, but at once the two men pushed into the hallway. Deputy Smith was apologetic. We saw your carriage pick up the slave this afternoon. Walt here convinced the judge you ought to be questioned. He showed Bert the warrant. I had nothing to do with that, Bert said. I left the carriage on Center Street and someone helped himself to it. You'll have to come along anyway, the deputy insisted. Tomorrow will be time enough, won't it? asked Bert. I don't want to leave my sister here alone. She's big enough to look after herself, Walt interrupted. Deputy Smith looked at Laura, who stood in the shadows behind Bert. You'll be safe enough, Miss Eastman. No one will bother you. I guarantee that. I'm sorry, Bert. You'll have to come with us. He seemed to find this duty his duty unpleasant. Bert was silent, then his shoulders slumped, and Laura knew he had given up. I'll get my coat, he said. Laura followed him into the kitchen where his coat hung on a peg, hoping for a word alone with him. But Walt was right on their heels. We'll have to keep an eye on this fellow, said Walt, so as he don't try to run out the back door. Before he left, Bert stopped in the front hall. Lock the door, Laura, he advised, and don't let anyone in. Pa and Abby will be home by morning. I'll be all right. Laura's mouth was dry and it was difficult to talk. After they had gone, she bolted the door. Lamp in hand, she climbed back to the bedroom, quickly rolled back the carpet and lifted the trap door. Bert's gone, she told Martin. They had a warrant to take him in for questioning. Martin's eyes looked up at her with a mute appeal. Never before she had seen such an expression of despair. He climbed down, carefully replaced the trap door and carpet. I'll be going, he said. You can't. You don't know the way. You can tell me. Laura shook her head. You'll never, you'd never find the place alone. You'll just have to wait until tomorrow. Pa will be home then and he'll know what to do. But the boat's coming, but tonight the boat's coming and my pappy is waiting. I know. Laura could understand his impatience and longing. Your uncle's coming, Martin reminded her. The one who doesn't believe in helping slaves get away. I'll find the river, don't you worry. Laura wondered what Uncle Daniel would do if he found out they were hiding an escaped slave. He would never forgive Pa, and he might go straight to the sheriff. I have to leave, Martin sounded desperate. I'd rather die than get sent back to my master. 
Laura saw the anguish in his face and knew suddenly that it was up to her now. You're right, Martin, she said slowly. We'll have to leave tonight, but you can't go alone. You'd get lost, and you'd never get to the house in, on the river in time. I'm going with you. Martin's face showed such surprise that Laura almost laughed. I can do it, she said stoutly. I know how to get to the Tryon house. She began to make plans. We won't go on the road. The slave catchers will be out tonight, especially now that George, that other slave, has escaped. Martin was mute, staring at her as if trying to decide if she had lost her mind. We'll go through the woods, Laura said. We'll stay as close to the road as we dare, so as not to get lost. You'll need a warm jacket. I'll see if Bird has one that will fit you. I don't want you to get in trouble, Miss Laura. Martin looked more worried than at any time since she had first seen him. You don't need to worry about me, said Laura. I'm not like some girls who have never done anything but cook and sew and play on the piano. My mother used to say I was a tomboy. I used to know every nut tree and berry patch for miles around. She looked down at her long dress and noticed a three-cornered hole in the skirt where the thorny branch in the woods had caught it. All at once, she remembered what a difficult task lay ahead. She remembered how hard it had been to walk in her long skirts up the overgrown lane to Tryon's Folly by daylight. How could she expect to travel more than a mile around the edge of Lewiston all the way to the river at night? She couldn't do it. Yet she had to. I know what I'll do, she declared. I'll wear a pair of Bert's pants. Taking the lamp with her, she ran to her brother's room, where a thorough search of the wardrobe and chest of chores turned up an old brown shirt that was slightly large for her, plus Bert's Sunday pants and his school pants. Both were much too large, and besides, this trip through the woods and try on cellars would ruin them. Her brother's work pants were downstairs in the shed, but she knew they were no smaller than his good trousers. It wouldn't help to wear pants that would just that would trip her up just as her skirts would. Why she couldn't have grown as fast as Bert? By right, she should be bigger than he. Still carrying the lamp, she entered the small attic that opened off Bert's room. Several boxes and trunks were stored under the slanting roof. In the third box she opened, she found exactly what she needed. Bert's clothes he'd worn as a boy, a pair of black pants and a jacket. She also took out a coat that would fit Martin in a worn cap. Her own shoes would have to do. She'd put on her sturdiest pair. Back in Bert's room, she proceeded to dress in his old clothes, buttoning a jack the jacket over Bert's brown shirt for warmth. For a final touch, she set a cap at a jaunty angle and tucked her long hair under it. A glance in the mirror showed her a mischievous face with big, excited eyes. She felt more alive than she had for years. When she peered in the doorway to her room, she was satisfied to see Martin's look of surprise and to hear the ring of truth in his voice as he said, For a minute, I thought you were a boy. Time began to race. The moon was dropping lower in the sky, and as soon as it was out of sight, they must be ready to leave. Laura filled a lantern with potter's oil and stuffed several lucifers into a pocket of the jacket. Then, leaving a lamp burning on her dresser, she and Martin hurried from room to room, looking out of the windows on all sides of the house to see if anyone was lurking in the shadows. Just as she had begun to hope that the slave catchers had stopped watching the house, Martin called out softly from her parents' room. She reached the front window in time to see a man saunter past on the road. Even without the moon's light, she could see that his head was turned toward the house. A few minutes later, he came... Back again, walking in the same measured way. We'll have to watch him in the moment and leave the moment he's out of sight, said Laura. Putting out the light, she led the way down the stairs in the dark. In the pitch black kitchen, she stumbled against a chair. If she couldn't find her way across her own kitchen, how could she make her way through the woods she had not been in for four years? Quietly, she opened the back door. Stay close to me, she whispered to Martin. We'll head for that tree. She pointed to a large maple that stood halfway between the house and the woods. If anyone shouts at us, just keep going. Never mind about me, just run. She made a slow, careful survey of the yard. Nothing moved and there was no sound. Someone could be hiding in the orchard to the right of the yard or in the woods toward, the, toward which she planned to run. But that was a chance she would have to take. Do you see anyone, she asked. No, answered Martin. Keep watching while I look for our sentry. She ran to the parlor and waited until the man walked by and disappeared to the east. She raced back to the kitchen. Now, she panted. Laura sprinted across the lawn and Martin followed her. Flight by night. 
As she ran toward the woods, Laura's first thought was how easy it was to run without skirts. Boys were certainly lucky. Martin reached the window, reached the shadow of the maple tree almost as soon as she did. There they paused. She was about to make a dash for the woods when she heard the clip-clop of horses' hooves on the road. A horse and rider came into view from the direction of Lewiston. Soon they were joined by the sentry Laura had seen patrolling the road in front of the house. Scarcely breathing, she and Martin waited while the men talked, looking often toward the Eastman house. If the men glanced toward the backyard, would they see the two who were standing in the shadow of the maple? Laura thought not. She and Martin were wearing dark clothes, and Martin had the added advantage of a dark-skinned face. Moving cautiously, she pulled her cap low over her forehead and lifted the collar of the jacket to hide as much as possible of her white skin. After the longest five minutes of her life, the men parted, the one on horseback traveling toward Lewiston and the other walking east. As soon as the sentry's back was turned, she and Martin fled toward the woods. Once under the cover of the trees, Laura paused to catch her breath. Stay close to me, she warned Martin again. We mustn't get separated. Hang on to the back of my jacket. She started forward slowly with the lantern in one hand and holding the other hand outstretched. A branch scraped harshly across her face and she came to a sudden halt, clutching her cap to keep from losing it. Martin, close on her heels, bumped into her. I can't see a thing, she whispered. I wish I dared light this lantern. Let me carry it, Martin suggested. Then you can use two hands to fight off those branches. They started forward again. It was easier, Laura found, now that she had both hands free. Also, as time went on, her eyes became more accustomed to the dark, and soon she could see the black trunks of maple and beech and oak and the flurry clumps of pine and spruce. She began to regain the confidence she once had when in the woods. Now and then, a slight tug on her back of her jacket told her that Martin was with her. The ridge road was on their left, and from the start, she had tried to bear in that direction. By now, she should have reached it. Were they lost already? Surely not, not in these woods she had once known so well. Then, to her relief, she heard of a rumble of a carriage wheels not far off. Martin pulled at her jacket, and sh she knew he, too, had heard the carriage. Moving toward the sound, she saw ahead of her a white band of the road, gleaming dimly in the starlight. Seconds later, a horse and carriage came into view, traveling at a quick pace. Even in the faint light, Laura recognized the horse. It was Sally. Someone was on the carriage seat leaning forward to urge the horse on, but Laura couldn't make out its features. The carriage passed the two hiding in the woods. Laura was about to move on when a horse and rider came pell-mell down the road after the carriage. She heard the rider shout, Hello, where are you going? A voice answered from the carriage, Down the road a piece. What business is it of yours? That looks to me like the Eastman carriage, the one that, the kidnapped, that kidnapped the runaway this afternoon. That it is, the man in the carriage admitted. It turned up on Center Street not half an hour ago, and the sheriff asked me to take it back to where it belongs. No one's at home at the Eastman place but the girl, and she's asleep. Sam's been watching the house ever since young Bert was picked up. The light went out in her room some time back. Sam must be the sentry who had been patrolling the road in front of the house, Laura decided. I heard about Bert, said the man in the carriage. Well, I'll put this rig in the barn and give the horse a bag of oats. No need to wake the girl. Laura leaned against the tree, while, waiting while the horse and rider cantered past on their way back to Lewiston. Martin whispered, Too bad we can't get that carriage and ride to the river. I wish we could, but we're safer in the woods. Too many people were abroad tonight, Laura thought. The carriage would surely be stopped before they could reach Tryon's Folly. I know, Martin agreed. Well, we better move on. Keeping the ridge road in sight on the left, they pushed ahead, making good time until they neared a farmhouse. At their approach, the farmer's dog set up such a racket that his owner came outside to investigate. The dog ran directly toward the woods where Lauren and Martin were standing, afraid to stir, lest the crackle of dry leaves and branches betray them further still. Still further. They could hear the man call, Come back here, Rupert. I'm not chasing after any porcupines or skunks tonight. But Rupert was persistent. And finally, the farmer gave in, saying, All right, you win. I'll get my gun. Hearing this, Laura and Martin waited only until the farmer entered his house for his gun. Then they ran as fast as they could. In spite of her fright, Laura tried to keep her bearings. Their only hope was to stay in sight of the road. Although her memory of the land around Lewiston was coming back to her, she knew she couldn't find her way deep in the woods at night. 
The barking of the dog proved to be a guide as well as a spur, for it helped Laura to lead the way in a wide circle around the farm. She and Martin pushed on until they fell to the ground, completely out of breath. When the pounding of blood in her ear stopped, Laura listened for the dog, but silence had descended on the woods. Now I know how you fell with the bloodhounds after you, she told Martin. They're worse, he said. They make that awful howling noise, and you know they never give up. Martin sat up and examined the lantern to which he had clung, oops, I'm sorry, clung all through their wild flight. It's still whole, he said. Laura struggled slowly to her feet and walked unsteadily to the edge of the nearby clearing. We've come around to the north of Lewiston, she said. Mohawk Street is over there, she pointed to the left. So if we go straight ahead, we should reach the river. She didn't want Martin to guess how worried she was. The trip was taking longer than she had expected. What if the boat had already come and gone by the time they reached Tryon's Folly? In a few minutes, they came onto the river road across Judge Joe's estate. Laura felt encouraged. This was the last part of the tri their trip had gone quickly. We're almost there, she said softly. Praise be, answered Martin. They hurried north in the shelter of the trees, for Laura did not dare to cross the road at this point. Judge Joe's land was too open for safety. When the dark mass of woods near Tryon's Folly lay opposite them, she whispered, We'll cross here. The road was empty in both directions, so she had scurried over with Martin beside her. They had barely reached the other side when hoofbeats clattered out of the drive at Judge Stowe's and came down the road toward Tryon's Folly. Martin dropped to the ground and lay motionless while Laura crouched beside him. Now the horse and rider were approaching more slowly. Laura could see a piebald horse and atop of him the tall shape of Walt. Had he seen them dash across the road? To Laura's relief, Walt continued down the road. With a whispered word to Martin, she stood up. Stepping cautiously, she led the way through the thick undergrowth until they reached the comparative openness of the lane. Here she paused to listen. With f dismay and fear, she heard the crashing sound of someone hurrying through the woods behind them. Walt must have seen them after all. Laura could think of only one thing. She must get Martin to the river before the slave hunter cut up with them. Come on, she urged. Martin obeyed, and in two or three minutes, they burst out of the woods into the narrow clearing around Tryon's folly. Without a backward glance, Laura ran headlong toward the house. Martin's feet pounded after her, together, and together they dashed into the parlor. Bats whirred over their heads so close that Laura could feel the air stirred by their flight. But she had no time to be afraid of mere winged creatures. By the dim light that came through the high windows, she rushed through the rooms to the kitchen. She flung open the door to the cellar. Here are the stairs. Put your hand on the railing. The darkness seemed to reach up to, smoother, to smother them. Laura felt as if she were descending into a well. Behind her, Martin gasped, Where are you? Here, she tried to sound calm. Give me the lantern. She placed it on the floor, pulled a lucifer from her pocket, and struck it. In the flare, she could see to open the lantern and touch the wick with the flame. She jumped to her feet, crossed to the door in the west wall, and then pulled it toward her. Ahead lay a short tunnel that sloped down to the next cellar. Come on! She started ahead with the light. Watch out for the stairs at the end of the tunnel. Yes, Miss Laura, said Martin. Laura heard both fear and bravery in his voice. Just a little farther, she encouraged him. You'll soon be crossing the river. They were in the second cellar, and Martin had the trap door raised when Laura, pausing to listen, heard a door open someplace upstairs. Footsteps thudded far overhead. It sounded as if more than one person was up there. Walt must have had a deputy or another slave catcher with him. Laura exchanged a terrified glance with Martin. Close the trap door and hurry! She plunged down the steps, stumbling, almost falling in her haste. With frantic with excitement, she glanced desperately around the third cellar. Where is that trap door? she asked herself. Only this afternoon she had been through these cellars, but now in her panic she couldn't recall where the entrance to the next cellar was. Martin snatched the lantern from her hand and scurried around the room. In a moment he had located the trap door in the floor beneath the windows that faced the river. S Excuse me. Swiftly he raised the door, set the lantern on the floor, and stood aside waiting for Laura. Go ahead, she whispered. Down there you'll find a door on the side of the cellar toward the river. Run out and hide. Martin scrambled down the ladder while Laura seized the lantern and turned to climb down after him. Her foot found the top rung of the ladder and reached, she reached for the trap door. 
To her horror, she heard footsteps enter the room she was leaving. She had no time to lower the door. Below her, Martin warned, Watch out for the last rung, it's loose. Directly above her head, someone asked, Is that you, Martin? Surprised, Laura looked up into the dazzling light. The person who was holding the lantern asked in a puzzled tone, Laura? With such relief flooded through Laura that she almost lost her hold on the ladder. The man in the cellar was Joel Todd. Okay, so... How exciting is that? They're at Tryon's Folly and they're about to get Martin to the boat, hopefully. And now, luckily, Joel Todd has showed up to help. All right, so tomorrow, tune in for the last part of Freedom Crossing and I'll see you then.